Welcome everybody. Um, welcome to, the, to this Adam Smith Institute lunchtime uh, lecture. Um, let me very quickly um, point out the team uh, to you. In the back we have um, Dr. Matt Sampiri and Dr. Eamon Butler, uh, founders of the Adam Smith Institute. And uh, behind them we have um, Sally Thompson, who is the head of communications, Sam Bowman, who is um, the head of research, and uh, I am the um, head of programs. Allow me to uh, introduce our speaker today. Dr. Razin Sali is a senior lecturer in international political economy at the London School of Economics. He heads its international trade policy unit. He is also a visiting professor at the Institut d'études politiques Sciences Po in Paris and at the Tallinn Technical University in Estonia. In 2006, he started the European Centre for International Political Economy, a think tank dedicated to trade policy. The subject of today's talk is Liberty Outside the West, the shift of the world economy to emerging markets and what it means for freedom. Um, Dr. Sally will speak for uh, about 30-35 minutes, after which we will have um, questions and answers. Dr. Razin Sally. Singapore. I've witnessed 
an awakening continent, Asia that is, whose peoples are vertical, up and doing, grasping newfound economic freedom with both hands. And I want a Renaissance seat at this great 21st century drama and watch the story unfold. Uh, Singapore, my new base camp, faces east and west at the main choke point of Asian maritime trade. It is where liberty outside the West got a massive boost with its founding by that intrepid, autodidactic, polymath, colonialist Stanford Raffles in 1819. Raffles' vision was of a vast emporium, as he put it, fully open to trade and to migrants in search of work and enterprise. It strikes me he was possibly the first to realize in concrete form Adam Smith's vision in the wealth of nations. Singapore today is in some respects different to the Singapore that Raffles, uh, as a member of the East India Company, as a British colonialist, envisioned. Uh, it has certainly more of a nanny state than uh, Raffles would have liked. But in other respects, Singapore today is something that is still very much the child or the grandchild of Stanford Raffles. That's Lee Kuan Yew's Singapore today. It is fully open to trade. Zero duties on all goods coming in and out. It is fully open in a non-discriminatory fashion to foreign investment. Not least, and I say this bearing in mind some of the <coughs> Neanderthalic parochial and protectionist members of the Conservative Party, Singapore is fully open to people as I said before, to migrants in search of work and enterprise, uh, which is very much part of the broader definition as understood in the 19th century of free trade. Singapore's population has increased by one million just in the last five years, by the way. So much for my personal reasons. Now for reasons to do with uh, public affairs. We hear much about the rise of the rest, non-Western emerging models led by China and the other so-called BRICS. It's supposed to be their century, especially an Asian century or a Pacific century. The center of global political and economic gravity is shifting from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And at the heart of this shift is an Asian drama. Now this is not the Asian drama described by the Swedish development economist Gunnar Merdal back in the 1960s. He wrote a three-volume work called The Asian Drama then. Bear in mind Merdal shared the Nobel Prize in 1973, I think it was, with Hayek. Um, uh, <coughs> not for reasons of intellectual alliance, obviously. Now Merdal in The Asian Drama portrayed a continent trapped in unequal exchange with the West, and mired in myriad market failures that precluded escape from poverty and progress to prosperity. The conclusion that Verdal and other development experts drew, with a few exceptions, Peter Bauer being one of the signal exceptions, was that only massive infusions of Western aid, Soviet-style planning, and import substituting protection could overcome these market failures and kickstart industrialization, growth, and development. In a cultural echo from the same period, B. S. Naipaul, in his first book on India, An Area of Darkness, dismissed India as, I quote, a broken, wounded continent full of walking skeletons. Karl Marx, Max Weber, and others, as we know, wrote off China and India, given their seemingly hidebound, progress-shy traditions. How different the Asian drama looks today, the exact opposite, indeed, of Merdal's diagnosis and prognosis. But China, as Napoleon feared, has awoken from its centuries-long slumber and is shaking the world. India is unbound, according to one of the leading uh, commentators on modern India, Kocharak Das. East and South Asia are on the move, globalizing and catching up with the West, though there is a long, long way to go. There are parallel, though less exuberant, stories from Brazil, other parts of Latin America, even these days from a few places in Africa. Technological innovation has, of course, enabled much of this transformation, but its crucial enabler has been liberalization of internal and external trade, 
of domestic and foreign investment, of product and factor markets. These have been essentially negative acts, as Hayek would describe them. That's to say, they've removed restrictions that repress economic activity, and they've unleashed the animal spirits of ordinary people. Peter Bauer's descriptions of the enterprise of small-scale poker producers in the Gold Coast and of rubber growers in Malaya, penned in the 1940s, holds true of hundreds of millions of people today. And it's something that one can see all over China and in the bustle of Hong Kong, in Vietnam, among the emerging middle classes of, law of small and large town India. So people now have incentives to exercise their natural liberty, as Adam Smith called it, his, word for ec his term for economic freedom. They're doing so with gusto, and they're transforming the world in the process. To use a, a Nike Pauline term, this is indeed a continental awakening. So how can we make sense of this liberty outside the West? One can talk in terms of public policies and institutions, and I'll do that in a moment. But social scientists tend to overlook the obvious, what stares them in the face when they look out of their hotel or car windows. That's to say, the unprecedented expansion of economic freedom outside the West. So what is happening exactly? What are liberty's prospects outside the West? What impact will it have back in the West? I don't know the answers, but I can have a stab at the questions and offer a few broad brush observations. Let me start with what I think are the broad political and economic trends. Uh, the last economic era, roughly from about 1980 to 2008, the onset of the crisis, <coughs> was the most successful combination of globalization, growth, and prosperity in history. It did benefit the West, so despite recent talk of middle class stagnation, uh, we did see Western companies vastly improving their productivity, not least because they could outsource and offshore production uh, to uh, Asia in particular. We saw consumers benefit hugely through lower prices and much greater product choice. And we did see, through these combinations, a big increase in average real living standards. In other words, the freedom to choose did expand considerably, even in the West. But even more important was what happened when the rest, that's to say, the non-West, came on board. Underdeveloped countries, as they used to be called, perhaps more accurately, cast off post-colonial isolation and embraced the world economy. The East Asian Tigers started earlier, of course, but they were joined subsequently by the BRICS and others. Protectionist barriers tumbled. The average uh, rate of tariff protection, uh, nominal rate of tariff protection in the developing world is about 10%. It was 30% or so in the mid-1980s. Current, account, current accounts have been opened. Currencies have become convertible. Internal licensing restrictions were removed, as with the end of the license raj in India. Markets were open to foreign investment, even in services, not just in goods. Jeffrey Sachs and Andrew Warner tell us that only 20% of the world's population, overwhelmingly in the, in the West, lived in broadly open economies, open to trade and investment in 1980. The figure today is about 90%, I would guess, uh, of countries that are broadly open to the world economy. They may not be Hong Kong or Singapore, but they're open to the rest of the world. According to the late Angus Madison, Asia accounted for 60% of the world's population, but less than 20% of its GDP at purchasing power parity in 1950. By, 20, by 2001, Asia's share of world GDP had doubled. By 2030, it should account for more than half of world GDP. Uh, according to some estimates, China will overtake the United States as the largest economy in the world uh, in the middle of this decade. Uh, according to Angus Madison, China may well have already taken over the United States as the largest 
economy in the world. So we are seeing a transformation at the least uh, equivalent to what we saw after the American Civil War with the entry of the United States, Germany, Russia and Japan into the world economy. We may well be in the early phases of a transformation the like of which we might not have seen since the Industrial Revolution. That's the scale of what's happening. What about the crisis? Well, it initially affected the rest as much as the West. Both suffered contractions in growth, trade, and investment. But the post-crisis recovery has opened up a chasm between the West and emerging markets. The West, as we know, suffered a financial crisis, and that has wrecked public finances, leaving holes, gaping holes, in household, corporate, and government balance sheets. Hence, an anemic recovery, though with exemptions, such as Germany and the economies that are plugged into the German economy, the Scandinavian countries, <coughs> Australia and Canada. Now, what unites these countries is that they have relatively low levels of public and private debt, and they're also plugged into the Chinese economy, whether it be through capital-intensive exports, such as Germany and its satellites, or resource exports as is the case with Australia and Canada. But this is, these are the Western exceptions. The main emerging markets, in contrast, except Russia, and Russia had a financial crisis, the main emerging markets went into the crisis with healthy balance sheets, hence a less severe crisis and a sharper rebound. China and India sailed through the crisis. They grew at about 10% last year. Uh, developing Asia close to 10%. Even Sub-Saharan Africa, 5%. And the latest forecasts, such as that from the IMF World Economic Outlook, forecasts emerging markets to grow at about 6.5% this year, 8% uh, or more in developing Asia, compared with only 2.5% in the OECD. Now, those very basic facts and figures tell us two things. First, the crisis has induced sharp divergence of economic performance between the West and emerging markets. And second, this short-term divergence has accelerated the long-term convergence between emerging markets, particularly in Asia, and the West. And that has profound long-term political and economic ramifications. There is a similar divergence, I would argue, in the global policy. <coughs> <laughs> Someone, somewhere, this is like what I'm about to say. Um, the West's crisis interventions, the financial bailouts, fiscal stimulus packages, extra loose monetary policy, have vastly increased public debt, amounting to about 30% of OECD GDP in 2008. That's akin to financing the world war. That has stark medium to long-term macroeconomic implications, as we know, for taxes, expenditure, interest rates, and inflationary expectations. But perhaps less reported, these crisis interventions have also provided cover for big government micro-interventions that, at the margin, have reversed previous liberalization during that golden age of globalization before the crisis. That distorts competition and restricts economic freedom in the West and compromises prospects for recovery. That, I would argue, is the record of the Obama administration and the Democrat-controlled Congress of 2008 to 2010. It's also the record of the EU, plagued as it is by stalled internal market liberalization. The EU has something called the 2020 Agenda, which is a damp squib and has a lot of industrial policy machinations in it. And a bureaucratic, almost command economy approach to sovereign debt crises in the periphery. And what we see are European elites sleepwalking to disaster with solutions that are really in the form of bureaucratic centralism. We're talking fiscal policy here, rather than the kind of market economy solutions that, that uh, would seem to be rather commonsensical to many. 
Most emerging markets, in contrast, again with the Russian exception, and Russia has huge problems, retain healthier balance sheets and have a much more promising outlook. I don't want to sound too rosy about emerging markets and gloss over flaws. There are several, not to mix metaphors here, clouds on the horizon. First, market reforms have stalled. So a kind of golden age of Washington consensus style liberalization in the emerging world is, is no more. Uh, that is true of China, India, and Brazil. Russia is more extreme. It has gone in the other direction. It has deliberalized under, under President, now Prime Minister Putin. All these countries have not moved significantly from first generation, Washington consensus type reforms, with hindsight easier reforms, such as border liberalization of trade and investment, they haven't moved from that to second generation reforms, which are much more complex, politically sensitive. These are essentially domestic regulatory reforms to unlock competition and boost productivity. On the trade front, which I deal with, it's about subsidies, public procurement, product standards, technical standards, <coughs> customs procedures, and the like. Much more complicated to remove than basic tariffs and quotas at the border. On the domestic front, we're talking about all sorts of red tape. On property rights, contracts, licensing arrangements, opening and closing businesses, paying taxes, labor markets, all of which continue to stifle emerging markets business climates much more than in the West. That's reflected in the World Bank's doing business index, where we see the countries still occupy eight of the top ten places. Hong Kong and Singapore are first and second. <coughs> China is 79th, Indonesia 121st, Brazil 127th, India 134th, Russia 123rd. And let's not forget that these regulations repress economic freedom at the same time. And that's reflected in the rankings of both the Heritage Foundation's Economic Freedom Index and uh, the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom of the World Index. Hence, and just to emphasize that point, I've just come back from China, and what you see in China is not just store liberalization, but also an increase of industrial policy to support about 100 <coughs> behemoth state-owned enterprises, which are very closely linked to the Communist Party itself. Now that distorts the Chinese economy, but also it translates into trade tensions <coughs> with the United States, the European Union, and others. So as I said, I'm not glossing over these very real problems in emerging markets, uh, but I'm still, I hope, describing a trend of the expansion of economic freedom, given where they were only two or three decades ago. It still leaves huge unfinished business to expand economic freedom outside the West. Generally, emerging markets institutions, public administration, property rights, contracts, domestic regulatory authorities, remain relatively weak and keep business costs high, repressing entrepreneurship, innovation, and potential. <coughs> and that affects not just foreign traders and foreign investors, but perhaps more importantly, domestic traders and domestic in investors. And this happens under political systems which range all the way from authoritarianism to democracy. Emerging market powers also suffer their own divisions, witness the mistrust and geopolitical rivalry between China, India, and Japan in Asia. They're still reactive, and they don't display real leadership in global economic institutions like IMF, World Bank, and WTO, as was on display with the appointment of yet another French head of the IMF. And they suffer from highly malintegrated regional markets, which are beset by high barriers to intra-regional trade, investment, and the movement of workers. Still a far cry from the EU and NAFTA in North America. So my conclusion here is that emerging markets are indeed rising, and the shift to the East, Asia in particular, is undeniable. But the constraints I have mentioned still hold back the non-Western world. And that means, contrary to much hype today, we will not see Chinese 
or indeed wider Asian or emerging market leadership for some time. Let me now turn uh, to ideas and history, and I'll start with ideas. Um, the liberal tradition in its many forms is a product of the West. These ideas, of course, come from Greek, Roman, Jewish, and Christian minds. They bloomed into West European modernity a few centuries ago. They took secular form, and they found expression in public life. Economic freedom gradually expanded under more limited government, the rule of law, and other market-supporting institutions in the state and civil society. Political liberalism accompanied this trend in some places, notably in the Anglo-Saxon countries, but less so in others. And after 1945, political and economic liberalism permeated all Western societies, though coexisting uneasily with rival collectivist traditions. Those of us who are Western-centric, and I think that applies to the majority of those who would describe themselves as classical liberals, like to think that liberty is the West's intellectual property, with no equivalent outside the West. It is for the West to export to benighted lands, to lead them out of their areas of darkness, as V.S. Nightfall would put it. Now that immediately creates a big problem. Time and again, in various places outside the world's West, I felt a sense of unease when men in white suits have preached the virtues of Smith, Hayek, Friedman, Reagan, and Thatcher to black, brown, and yellow audiences. When they do so, without any reference to indigenous liberal thought, where it exists, and when they assume that it's simply a matter of transplanting Western practice, it comes across as patronizing and colonial. When locals do this, fresh from American graduate programs and with an American twang to their accents I have written down here, they come across as coconut brown, an Indian term. That's to say brown on the outside, white on the inside. Now when a very good South Korean student of mine this year at the LSE read that, <coughs> his immediate reaction was to say, I'm a banana. That's to say yellow on the outside, white on the inside. So no wonder this attitude doesn't work beyond group of schools of uh, nutty libertarians who split hairs between what Hayek said on Monday morning and what Mises said on Tuesday afternoon. I have in mind mainly some Americans here, not, 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 not so much people this side of the pond. And that smacks of Lord Macaulay's much quoted passage in his minute on education for India, one and, well, uh, almost two centuries ago. I quote, we must at present do our best to form a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing for a rampant relativism here, postmodern political correctness in the non-Western world. I agree that the liberal tradition comes mainly from the West, and I'm all for plugging the ideas of those in the Western classical liberal canon. But it will not work unless a serious connection is made with local intellectual traditions and local history. It's the height of arrogance and ignorance worthy of a Parisian salon intellectual or a Cape Dorsey diplomat to assume that there are no worthwhile parallel streams of thought outside the West. And that smacks of another Macaulay quote, and he said this without being able to read either Sanskrit or Arabic. Or, um, uh, Arabic, a single shelf of a good European library is worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. Now, the problem here perhaps is that the West, of course, has a corpus of reasonably coherent ideas passed down the ages in the liberal tradition. If you take China, for example, uh, there are actually plenty of affirmations of economic liberalism statements, not least in passages in Confucius's Analects. Uh, but as several Chinese have pointed out to me, there is no coherent set of systematic ideas in a liberal corpus. Uh, rather, there are those affirmations and 
if you like, something very Humean, uh, an ex post recognition of facts on the ground, as we see in China today. It is recognized that economic freedom has expanded, and that becomes internalized. Now, I'm the first to admit my lack of knowledge of liberal intellectual traditions outside the West, one of my areas of darkness. All I'm arguing for here is some humility and a serious effort to explore non-Western liberal streams of thought and make the connections with Western classical liberalism, all the better to make a more powerful intellectual case for the expansion of economic freedom outside the West. That's a challenge primarily for locals, less so perhaps for visiting Westerners. Now let me turn to some potted history. Now, a Western-centric view of non-Western development runs along the following lines. It was through Western colonialism that European-style commerce and commerce-supporting institutions were transplanted elsewhere. Markets were widened across lands and seas. Backwaters were brought into contact with advanced commercial hubs in Western Europe. Now, there is some truth, a grain of it, in this script but much of it is plain wrong. And the history of long distance trade, which from its beginnings to about the 15th century was overwhelmingly a non-Western phenomenon, tells a different story. And given the Asian slum to my talk, I will focus on trade in the Indian Ocean. Long distance trade started in the Tigris Euphrates Basin, one to two millennia before the Greeks and the Romans and then fanned out in a network across the Middle East. It was Arab traders who first rode the monsoon winds to trade in ports all over the Indian Ocean. The Pax Islamica, following lightning fast Muslim conquests, was the framework for flourishing trade across the Eurasian landmass and the Indian Ocean. Seafaring trade led the way, reaching as far as Chinese ports by the mid 8th, 8th century. Arab diasporas in coastal ports knitted this trade network together from East Africa to, to Asia. Um, a recent exhibition I went to in Singapore uh, at its new Art Science Museum. Yes, Singapore has museums these days. Uh, which is not the case uh, going back a couple of decades. Uh, this was an exhibition of uh, what's called the Beli Chong Shipwreck, an Arab Dao sunk off the coast of Java in the 9th century, containing a massive quantity of Chinese porcelain. It's truly massive. It was on its way back from China along what some people call Sinbad's Way, or what the author William Bernstein, the author of a very nice book on long distance trade called The Splendid Exchange, calls the Baghdad Canton Express. As the tales of the 1001 Nights describes Sinbad the Sailor, a Baghdadi trader plied this route all the way from the Middle East to China, stopping at entrepôts along the way. Now, the Mongol invasions smashed the Pax Islamica. Its successor, the Pax Mongolica, allowed land based trade to flourish for about a century, and that was indeed the last hurrah of the fabled Silk Route. The travel accounts of Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta give us a flavor of land and sea trade in this period. <clears throat> this brings me to the zenith of economic freedom outside the West in pre-modern history. Medieval Indian Ocean trade, before European colonization, the golden age of South and Southeast Asian commerce. So before the Portuguese muscled in, the Indian Ocean was, to use Hugo Brotius's term, mare libero. That's to say, the freedom of the seas, not controlled by any power, and fully open to trade. Coastlines were dotted with port qualities, as they are sometimes called. That's to say, independent towns and cities whose lifeblood was overseas trade. Freewheeling economic competition went in tandem with decentralized, flexible political institutions, which was the Indian Ocean's equivalent of what the economic historian Eric Jones calls the European miracle. Fractured geography and competing qualities combined to promote 
economic freedom, growth, and prosperity. Tomé Pires, an apothecary who accompanied the founders of the Portuguese Estado da India, describes the features of the system before it was obliterated by European mercantilism. Trade took place between these port polities, all the way from Aden and Hormuz uh, in the Middle East to Kambe, which is near Ahmedabad in modern Gujarat, Goa, Kanano, and Calicut on the Malabar coast, all the way across to Aceh, Malacca, and Makassar in the Spice Islands. Some had Hindu rulers and local populations, but Muslims dominated trade. In other places like Kambe, it was the other way around. Islam spread, crucially here, through trade and bourgeois example, not by the sword, as it did elsewhere. These were religiously tolerant, highly cosmopolitan places. Tomé Pérez counted 84 languages in Malacca, for example. In these entrepôts, there was a reasonable separation of market and state. In Malacca, trade tariffs were modest, 3 to 6% on imports, and zero duties on exports. Um, the latter, Malacca, had a legal structure for trade that prefigured the English common law. A customs judge, assisted by a panel of local and foreign traders, valued cargoes and conducted auctions. According to William Bernstein, this was, I quote, a medieval eBay in the tropics, in which good rules attracted good traders, who in turn insisted on better rules. Indian textiles, spices from the Malaccas, Chinese silks and porcelains were all traded vigorously and largely, and this is an echo of the modern GATT or WTO, without discrimination. Mare Libera united these poor politics. As Sultan Alauddin of Makassar put it, God made the land and the sea, the land he divided among men, and the sea he gave to them in common. It has never been heard that anyone should be forbidden to sail the sea. If you seek to do that, you will take bread from the mouths of the people. Now, the voyages of discovery, and then Portuguese, Dutch, and British colonial expansion, put paid to the system of natural liberty in the Indian Ocean. Vasco da Gama, Afonso de Albuquerque, and Francisco de Almeida barged in with extreme violence and commercial rapine, in search of Christians and spices, as they put it. They took control of the seas and then coastal entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs through murder and marauding, lying and stealing. They imposed extreme mercantilism and sought monopoly control. They grabbed markets from local trading diasporas and forced them to sell at below market prices so that they, the Portuguese, could sell on to captive European markets at large markups. The Dutch East India Company adopted similar goals and methods in the Spice Islands only with more ruthless efficiency and success. And the British followed in Dutch footsteps. It took the Pax Britannica later to restore Mare Liberum and freeish trade in the Indian Ocean. In the second half of the 19th century, the British Empire removed most mercantilist restrictions and allowed multilateral commerce to flourish. Chinese and Indian diasporas fanned out across the empire creating new trading networks. The system was, of course, shredded again in the first half of the 20th century. Now, many classical liberals with a strong sense of economic history I respect, not least Peter Bauer, talk about benign Western colonialism in terms of how Western institutions and practice and connections uh, uh, were extended through colonialism to the non-developed or the undeveloped world. But the point I want to make here is that Peter Bauer, and perhaps more recently now Ferguson in his book on empire, when they refer to this benign expansion of economic freedom, as it were, and prosperity, are really thinking of this perhaps relatively short experience of British colonialism, of the Pax Britannica, from roughly the second half of the 19th century to the beginning or the early decades of the 20th century. Fair enough, but one shouldn't overlook the previous eras of colonialism with the extreme mercantilism uh, I've just described. Fast forward. 
The last 60 years have seen a remarkable renaissance. We are familiar with the Asian comeback, starting with Japan and the East Asian Tigers, moving to China, and also now to India and Vietnam. These countries are at the heart of modern re-globalization. But what we do not sufficiently appreciate is that commercial clusters in and around coastal cities, closely connected with each other across the oceans, are the fulcrum of late 20th and early 21st century globalization, just as they were in previous eras of globalization. And that's perhaps most pronounced in East and South Asia. It recreates the golden age of Indian Ocean powers, <coughs> only this time its networks are complex manufacturing and services supply chains that link them to global markets. There's a political parallel too. We're accustomed to thinking of a world divided into land-based nation-states, the Westphalian system. Decolonization following Western imperialism exported the Westphalian system from the West to the rest. But it's striking that so much policy innovation that promotes economic freedom and commercial society takes place at sub-national levels, in provinces and municipalities, especially those that face the sea and look out to the rest of the world. This happens while politics and policies in national capitals seem to be stuck or moving at a snail's pace. It's something I see very keenly in the parts of Asia I go to. Policies are stuck in New Delhi, for example. Um, and India has a government that since 2004, being led by the Congress Party, that is simply not in the business of market reform. It is in the business of a giant redistribution to its vote banks. Uh, but you do see very interesting liberalizing policies happening in some of the states. Um, the one that where it's happening most is actually in Gujarat, which of course has a long history of a trading diaspora. And it happens mostly in an arc from the south to the west, but with interesting outlines now. You see a similar pattern in China, uh, and indeed in other places. Now that is an alternative map of the globe. Hong Kong and Singapore are today's Cambay, Calicut, Malacca, and Makassar. And these days they're connected not only with far-flung markets in the west, but also with the fastest globalizing parts of China and India. And it's in these mostly coastal strips that liberalization of markets, property rights, and a burgeoning middle class, and other features of commercial society, are blossoming most. They form the core of liberty outside the West today. They point the way to its future expansion. Now, this resonates very much with the vision of a lady called Jane Jacobs, who wrote a book going back about 30 years called Cities and the Wealth of Nations. And it also reminds me of a book that's just come out by the Harvard urban economist Ed Glazer, which also extols the virtues of cities. Hayek would approve. After all, he saw that cities, urban culture, uh, were very much the cradle, not just of prosperity, but also of cultural efflorescence. This is not quite the utopian vision of Richard Compton, who foresaw free trade leading to a world of cosmopolitan peacefully coexisting municipalities that would replace warring nation states, but Cobden would still improve enthusiastically. Let me very briefly, because I, I see we're uh, coming close to two o'clock, make a couple of observations about the mix of liberty and tradition, which is one, one section in my, my lecture. Um, now, it's often argued that this expansion of liberty uh, leads to atomization and anomie, and that's something that plagues the West. It's generally communitarians, many with a collectivist slant, who make that argument, of course. But it would be a mistake to view the expansion of liberty outside the West, or even perhaps inside the West, as a rel relentless march towards atomized individualism. If I looked across parts of Asia, individualism is indeed breaking out after centuries, indeed millennia, of political and social repression, with economic freedom as its driving force. But rarely is it atomized. Rather, it emerges and expands in the midst of strongly tradition-bound societies. 
And it's the family unit that remains particularly strong, though with stresses and strains in these parts of the world. The most extreme example I have here is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is perhaps the most capitalist society on earth, but unlike most of the West, it remains a very strong, family-based, tradition-bound society, as one sees from the many Chinese rituals, religious rituals, uh, that take place in Hong Kong. Though not in China, of course, because that was smashed during the Cultural Revolution. Now, this observation should warm the hearts of liberal conservatives or conservative liberals, who in the spirit of Burke, Tocqueville, and even Hayek, wish to see progress based on individual freedom, imminent in evolving societies that value their traditions and norms. Um, how can liberty expand while preserving valuable traditions in non-Western societies? Can they avoid the atomization and anomie, the dissolving social glue that one sees in much of the West? To Deepak Lal, in his book, uh, Unintended Consequences, yes, they can. These societies can modernize instrumentally, as he puts it, by importing techniques from the West, including economic freedom, while preserving, as he puts it, their habits of the heart. They can. I do apologize. Um, they can modernize without losing their souls. They do not have to westernize. I think that's too neat a distinction. There is an overlap between modernization and westernization, but I hope, with perhaps a degree of confidence, that expanding liberty outside the West will not lead to too much westernization in the form of socially destructive habits. Let me conclude on a note of public policy here. Uh, all over the world, the short-term challenge is to arrest the scientific government, and especially to contain illiberal crisis interventions in the wake of the recent crisis. The medium-term challenge is to get back to unfinished business, liberalization of trade and investment, and structural reforms to expand economic freedom. Non-Western economies still have big pockets of upfront protectionism. They have even bigger domestic barriers to enterprise. And it will indeed be a huge challenge to dismantle these barriers, given that they're defended by entrenched insider elites usually with the public sector and the organs of the state at their core. Also, the global economic crisis has brought Keynesian macroeconomics back into fashion, and with it, Pigovian welfare economics. Arthur Pigou was John Maynard Keynes' teacher at Cambridge, and arguably the father of 20th century welfare economics. And this is very much about microeconomic interventions to fixed alleged to fix alleged market failures. A social engineering mentality, the belief that superior technocratic minds can solve complex social and economic problems with targeted interventions, has been in the ascendant, not least in the pages of the Financial Times and indeed The Economist since the crisis. Welcome to the world, as David Brooks, my favorite New York Times columnist, puts it. Welcome to the world of Mr. Bentham and indeed Mr. Keynes, Mr. Stiglitz, and Mr. Krugman. That of Mr. Smith, Mr. Hume, and Mr. Hayek, the belief that markets are complex organisms, that governments, however expertly staffed, cannot possibly have enough knowledge to fine tune macro and microeconomic outcomes with detailed, precise regulations, that governments also fail through human fallibility, political pressure, and corruption, and correspondingly, that regulation should err on the side of caution and stick to general rules to allow markets to operate effectively has been less popular. And that is true of the rest as well as the West. Now, I have some confidence that the intellectual tide will turn in parts of the West. Indeed, it already has in the United States with elements, not all elements, but some elements of the Tea Party movement. In Canada, the re-election of a conservative government and Australia with its resurgent liberal opposition. And I have to hand here, at the behest of my friend David Henderson, who is sitting in the third row, that uh, this, is, this shouldn't be taken as a partisan point, because we have seen significant market reforms also under centre-left governments, notably in Australia and New Zealand in the 1980s. 
But looking beyond the short term, I have greater confidence that the expansion of liberty outside the West, especially in Asia, will provide even more tailwind. And the future of liberty is shifting east. More than ever, it lies outside the West. Very finally, therein lies a challenge for the West. And I'll quote here from Jan Tumlia, who um, not many of you will know, I would guess, but uh, uh, a very learned Czech emigre, uh, very much influenced by the ideas of Frank Knight and Hayek uh, and Buchanan uh, and uh, the German order of liberals from the Freiburg School. Uh, Tumlia was the GATT's long-time in-house philosopher as well as the head of its research department. And I quote from him, Western influence on the world, though still great, is declining. Eventually our societies will be the minor partner in the terrestrial enterprise. What do we want the majority to believe about the liberal idea that animated the West's historical achievement and that we continue to profess but have in recent decades ceased to act upon? What kind of world will it be if the majority comes to believe that the idea is a sham? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Sally. Um, I, I was definitely glued to my chair. Um, and I believe that the total silence in the room is usually also uh, good evidence of, of um, the success of, of a talk. Um, I thought it was quite extraordinary. I guess that if 